Uh, good evening and welcome. This is going to be actually a really interesting and exciting evening. Uh, I'm always excited to be here because it gives me a chance to touch base again with my uh, science and lab roots. Uh, I was a uh, uh, I was actually a wet lab scientist for uh, a few years before I gave it up for uh, for television, but this, this let me be a dilettante. I feel like I'm still doing some some kind of science here. The other reason I'm excited about, um, and and actually they asked me to do this before they even realized, is that I was actually a semifinalist in the journalist in space competition, which goes back to the 80s, right around the time, sadly, that the Challenger exploded, is when all of this was happening. And as, as I was uh, explaining, uh, to, uh, to Chris, we, we made it through a couple of rounds uh, of selection and then NASA canceled the program uh, altogether, I think because uh, Walter Cronkite was part of the competition way back then and I didn't think NASA uh, had the guts to tell Walter Cronkite that he wasn't going to go to space, <laughs> number one, and they were worried that if they did send him to space, they'd kill him and they didn't want to be known as the agency that killed Walter Cronkite. <laughs> So they canceled the they, they canceled the program, which is too bad because I was I was really you know chomping at the bit to to, to go up on the uh, on the shuttle, but in any case, when they first called me and said we're going to do something on space travel, I said well that's nice, but what's that have to do with the New York Genome Center? And as you'll hear, I think a little bit later on uh, from Chris, there's a lot that has to do between space travel and genomics and. Uh, your genome and what what uh, the genome uh, uh, what what it suffers, if you will, is that is that a fair word? The insults that it might suffer in a, in long uh, space travel. So this is going to be really interesting. We're going to uh, uh, I'll, I'll do an introduction. Chris has a very uh, brief 200 slide uh, presentation for you. <laughs> we call it Death by PowerPoint. Um, and then we'll we'll take uh, I'll ask a few questions and we'll take questions. Uh, from you guys, uh, and then we'll get to the part you're really here for, is the wine and the food out, uh, outside. So first, let me uh, introduce someone here who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, the New York Genome Center. Dr. Nicholas Robin, or Nico, uh, is Assistant Director of Computational Biology at the New York Genome Center. Uh, Nico is, supervises a team of scientists and analysts here at the Genome Center who are involved in the analysis uh, of sequencing data for a wide range of collaborative genomic research projects. He's going to explain that. He's in charge of RNA sequence analyses and cancer genomics within the computational biology department here at the New York Genome Center. Nico. Thank you very much. Um, so I have prepared very, very few slides just to uh, show a contrast with the next speaker. Um, so my personal connection with uh, space genomics, I'll be very quick is that, um, as you can hear, I'm French and I come from <laughs> Europe and uh, the way we envision space and space travel is fairly different. And my personal collection with that is that my uncle was uh, uh, very involved in the space industry in the 80s and the 90s, uh, right at the time where the European industry decided not to send people on space but to focus on commercial launch and had a lot of success in that. Uh, they sent uh, this week the hundreds, uh, for the hundredth time the, uh, the European rocket to send some satellite to space, and, and my uncle was very involved, and so as a family, we were following all of that. I remember going to the broadcasting of the launch in, in Paris, and that was, that was all very exciting. But that's clearly from, I've been for 10 years in New York, and I can tell you that there is a very different perspective between the Europeans and the Americans with respect to space. And uh, I may come with some provocative question uh, at the end of this session for, for Chris and for people who really believe we should send people to space. Um, but we'll see if I can um, send my questions. Uh, so welcome to New York Genome Center. I'm, I'm very happy to have all of you here. Uh, I have been working at the Genome Center for uh, more than six years, which means that there was five employees when I joined. We were in a small office uh, uptown. We then rented a space at Rockefeller University. We had our first sequencers. We started to sequence samples. And uh, we assembled a large consortium of uh, organization or academic institutions academic hospitals in New York and a little bit outside of New York. You see Princeton here, you see the Jackson Lab here, uh, Cold Spring Harbor in, in Long Island, and all of those uh, institutions had their own genomic facility, but they decided to put together a center for excellence and large-scale genomics and large-scale bioinformatics. So um, they wanted to continue to do sequencing, but they wanted a place where they can send a very large number of samples to do uh, 
large number of whole human, human whole genome, but other uh, kind of experiments as well. So uh, by the numbers, we have now 200 employees. You're on the first floor of the New York Genome Center, and we are having the first seventh floor of this building. Uh, we have so 200 employees. We have six faculty labs that are co-affiliated with some of the university in the city. Uh, we have a Center for Genomics of Neurodegenerative Disease, an innovation lab that produces new protocol and new, new technique uh, that uh, uh, go at the, the, the forefront of genomics, and a computational biology lab to analyze all the data that we generate. We have uh, five NovaSeq instruments, so that's the one that you see here, that's the latest generation of the Illumina sequencers. They can uh, do uh, generate a, a ton of data very quickly and very high quality. We have 20, uh, 12 HiSeq Extend, that's the version of the sequencer that was released in 2014. And we still have 12 HiSeq 2500, uh, which is the first type of instrument we had when we started the Genome Center. And there is approximately a 30-fold uh, difference in the, the, the power and the ability to sequence. So this field is moving very, very quickly. We regularly have to buy new instruments to be uh, really able to, to generate a lot of data, high quality data, and provide sequencing capacity to uh, every researcher in New York and outside of New York, to all our collaborators. By the number, we have done uh, 15,000 whole genome sequence last year, and thousands of whole exome and RNA seq samples as well. By and large, we sequence mostly human samples, probably around 90%. Uh, a lot of mouse samples, and then a couple of occasional other projects. The, uh, the, the last points I want to make are, are four different um, uh, components of the Genome Center. The one is, one is the Center for Genomic of Neurodegenerative Disease that focus for the moment on ALS, uh, but might expand to other diseases soon. We have assembled a big consortium of university labs here and, and uh, in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., we have sequenced 3,000 whole genome, uh, as well as RNA-seq from various locations in the spinal cord from autopsy sample. Uh, and we are doing something called spatial transcriptomic that allows us to uh, uh, do gene expression at various uh, locations on the spinal cord in some slides. And that's, uh, that, you know, all of that put together give us some hope that we can discover something new about the disease and, and hopefully uh, uh, provide a route for treatment. Another initiative that we're starting now is called Polyethnic 1000, and the goal is to provide cancer testing for the underserved population in New York uh, to improve the ethnic diversity of repository of somatic variants. So we have now done cancer genomics for about a decade. We have sequenced a large number of patients, and it, uh, a lot of those uh, uh, variants have been deposited to public database, and it turned out that about 85 to 90 percent of the patients are coming from a European ancestry, and we now think it's time to expand this and to sequence uh, patients from all population. And because we're in New York, we have representatives of virtually every uh, population on Earth that's represented here. They have cancer, they go to the hospital, we need to sequence them, and we need to have their variants present in the database, identify potential differences between uh, population, and uh, democratize the access to clinical care testing for everybody in New York. We have a very good innovation lab that uh, does a lot of work on single cell RNA-seq, has some technique called site-seq and cell hashing, and really can um, start to participate in the effort, uh, such as the human cell atlas, whose goal is to identify every single cell type in the human body. And that will be a tremendous resource for uh, discovering new biology and uh, really understanding all of the different components of the human body. And finally, we have a clinical lab that has uh, CLIA and New York State approval for a constitutional genome, so a doctor can send a sample to the New York genome, we would sequence the genome, and we can return uh, variants that are associated to a disease. And we have this, we are uh, conditional approval for the same in, in cancer, with cancer genome and transcriptome. That's the end of my presentation for the New York Genome Center. I'm staying here tonight, and I will be here after the talk. So if you have any questions, feel free to come and ask me. Now for our, our program, which is really interesting. And Nico, by the way, I forgot. I'm, I'm an alumnus of two of those uh, organizations that are part of the Genome Center. So maybe that's, uh, maybe that's why they keep asking me back. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, this is going to be really interesting. How does space travel change our genes? What NASA's study on twin astronauts reveals about the human genome on Earth, Mars, and beyond. And to tell us about that, it's Dr. Christopher Mason, who's an associate professor at Wild Cornell Medicine, 
with appointments at the Tri-Institutional Program in Computational Biology and Medicine between Weill Cornell Graduate School for Medical Sciences, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the Rockefeller University, as well as the Sandra and Edward Meyer Cancer Center, the File Family Brain and Mind Research Institute, and uh, is that a his or her? His Royal Highness, right? His Royal Highness Prince Alwalid bin Talal bin Abdulaziz Al Sud. Did I get it? Yep. <laughs> Institute for Computational Biomedicine. You get that all in one business card? <laughs> Please welcome Chris Mason. I do have a lot to tell you tonight. I will tweet out my slides. Um, I meant to do it before the talk, but I'll do it right after. Uh, I'll put it out on Twitter, which is now a presidential platform for major policy announcements. <laughs> so it's very official when I put it up there. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a really a relatively simple question, uh, but something that I'm very passionate about. And I'll tell you about sort of about you know 20 minutes of a discussion of what we've seen in uh, some studies of astronauts uh, undergoing spaceflight. And the last part of the talk, last sort of five minutes, is a very uh, forward-thinking uh, section of ideas that look out 500 years in the future. And I'll tell you about that, why 500, and what that means at the end. But I'm going to start with a bit of an overview of, of really the mission, of what are we doing uh, we, you know, in my lab and also collaborating with NASA to work on. So in particular, this is a, a schematic uh, from NASA that actually wants to envision how we will get to Mars using science and technology to explore. Mars, and it, on, actually in this rendering, it's unfortunate that it looks as if Mars is sucking all of the nutrients away from the Earth. That's not the plan, uh, that's not what's gonna happen. It's actually to put people on both planets. But the goal by NASA, uh, of which we have several grants in contributing to this effort, is to have people there by 2035, to actually have boots on the ground to begin to explore the red planet. But there's a lot of questions about how we're gonna do that, how will the body respond, uh, what can we do to protect astronauts, how can we understand and mitigate those risks. And so. To give a bit of context for that, I'll put it into what we think about in just in general for normal people on, on Earth. You can see, and this is a, for people in the back, I'll use the mouse on the back uh, uh, displays. But you know, all of us have normal cells that over time can accumulate mutations, and I'll tell you about some of that that happens in space tonight. And eventually this could even lead to cancers or metastasis uh, in, in the bad case of cancer um, that has gone aggressive. But this is really something that is a natural discourse of cells on Earth. You get mutated, all of you carry mutations, you're all mutants tonight. Uh, you know, some of you more than others, but you all look beautiful, I think you look great. But this is an inevitable part of just how cells uh, you know, endure the passage of time. In particular, one of my favorite review papers of this is just shows what happens over time if you look in females, how many cells have just lost, lost an X chromosome, it's just missing from the cells. You can see over time, it gets worse. Eventually, four or five percent of your cells might be missing a chromosome. And so in medical first year med students, when I give this lecture, I say down here, you know, most of them are fine and they're kind of smiling about it. But I found that older audiences do not laugh as much about this uh, trajectory. I call this the inexorable march towards molecular oblivion. And I'll, again, the, the med students are like, oh, yeah, that's no problem. I'm way down here. But it's not as funny for a lot of other audiences. Uh, but it's because things change. Eventually, um, cells get mutated. Cells get disrupted. Uh, another thing that changes over time, telomeres shrink over time. At the ends of your chromosomes, which carry your genetic payload, these little, these little sort of shoelaces at the ends of your chromosomes, the black parts, slowly shrink over time. And so these are just some things that we know change over time. But one of the questions from NASA and others has been, well, you know, essentially, how many days could we survive in space? These processes, which are normal, uh, will likely be accelerated or worsened. But, you know, there's been some estimates that maybe we could only have 200 or 400 days in space. But to go to Mars and back will probably take about 500 days. And so this is already in what has been estimated by some to be too dangerous. If you look at just all astronauts, uh, at least up till two. 2003, of what's sort of the, you know, what happens to astronauts, it's really not for the sheepish. Every single category of mortality is higher for astronauts. You can see here, they've got about an 11% chance of dying. Just if your job is astronaut, you've got about an 11% chance of dying. If you're, say, a mountain climber on Everest, it's about 3%. And just compared to people, normal age match control is about 1.8% chance. And so they do have a slightly higher risk of cancer, but they're mostly rare cancers. And so uh, this is an ongoing question about, you know, it's definitely a high risk job. A lot of things are changing. But really what's changing has been an, a long question at NASA. And about four years ago, I'll tell you the story of the, the last four years, there was a really unique opportunity where they had um, identical twins, Mark and Scott Kelly, and said, well, we've got this guy who's gonna go up in space and he's got an identical twin, so we should probably launch a study to study what happens to him. And of course, first thing we'll need is a patch. So, okay, so NASA said they commissioned an RFA to say people supply, uh, apply for the, for the mission. I, I applied, we were one of the labs that were selected out of 10. 
And you know, here you'll see this is you know on the artist here. I said, oh, this is great. You can see DNA in the middle and epigenetics. And I asked the artist, could you add you know RNA coming off the DNA or make some more you know complex molecules coming out? He said, no, that might make the patch too busy. And so I thought, well, <laughs> fine, I guess. But it's what it ended up being: it's the official patch. Because just to look at uh, Mark and Scott Kelly, what happens over the course of a year? So in 2015, they launched up in March 2015, uh, made his way up into space. And we had to plan a lot of things for the mission, some of which had been done before and some of which were brand new. One of the particular protocols that had been established but had never been uh, used for genomic studies is to actually draw blood in zero gravity. And so in particular, uh, this is the Wakata protocol, the one who first tested it out. And astronauts are you know, pretty amazing. They'll get up in the morning on you know, empty stomach and draw, you know, do a uh, urine collection, draw blood on themselves in zero gravity with a tube that's floating around, which might be hard if you're squeamish at phlebotomy. Uh, but here, you know, they do it, and again, you know, the astronauts that most of the times I've been in Houston are all in great shape. They draw their own blood in zero gravity. They're pretty jacked, and I get, you know, I was going back from Houston, like, i got to go to the gym because these guys are doing all this. i should, I got to keep up, and they don't just do it once. You see up here, usually nine or ten blood tubes per draw, and so this is just sort of the normal blood collection protocol that we'll use. But what we did for the first time in this study was say, well, we know it usually comes back to Earth. You can plop it in the Soyuz, have it return back through the atmosphere, and we said, well, let's see if we can get the samples to come back in Kazakhstan and bring them back and then do some genomics with them. So this is an example of some of our samples coming back. There's the retro thrusters shooting out in Kazakhstan. <laughs> samples coming back. Samples got picked up by helicopter and then repatriated back to the U.S. It's a verb I've never used until this study. I've never had anything get repatriated, but it came back. And we got it to Houston. We weren't sure for the very first experiment in 2015 if, it would, if we'd even get any good viable cells. But actually, it turns out this is the first tube of blood we collected in Houston. And after only 36 hours prior being floating around the Earth, it actually got about 99% cell viability. So it was actually great to see we could get fresh cells as well as frozen cells. We did both, and I'll tell you about both of them tonight. And so, uh, so, so he went up there for a year, and you know he's been up there for a full year. This was actually the day he was coming back. You can see the Soyuz uh, undocking from the space station. If you can read any Russian, it says, uh, let's go get vodka, I think is what it says right there. Uh, but de-docking from the space station, you can see the Earth below uh, passing by. And he made his way you know, back through the stratosphere, coming back to Earth safely. The chute deployed no problem uh, and made it, uh, landed again in Kazakhstan. Uh, and you can see here getting out of the, being helped to get out of, the, out, of the, out of the spacecraft and giving us kind of a good thumbs up saying that he was okay which was great to see. Uh, and I actually remember uh, my wife that night when I was coming back, she said, are you more nervous about the samples or the astronaut? And I was like, well, both. I'm very, I'm very concerned. But he made it back fine, and, and samples came back as well. But what's interesting is what he said, and especially in the first 24 and 40 hours when he came back, this is what he said, is that everything that he touched, it felt like it was on fire. It was because the weight of clothing itself had not touched his skin in a year. So just the weight of clothes alone was burning his skin and painful. Uh, and also he had rashes and discoloration anywhere he had contact. He felt like he needed to go to the hospital. And he said, he wrote in his book, he said, well, if I knew I hadn't just returned from space for a year, I would have definitely gone to the hospital. Uh, but the big question we have is, you know, really, just why? So what happened to him uh, in his body, sort of, and if we, what could we measure physiologically and molecularly that had changed in him to figure out what happened and maybe prevent it from happening to others? So what we did for the study is to study him before, during, and after space flight and measure everything we possibly could. So. Uh, from a, a molecular perspective, this includes genetic variation, uh, epigenetic changes I'll tell you about, RNA expression, proteomic changes, chromatin, antibody titers, B cells, T cells, telomere length, cytokines, metabolomics, microbiome <laughs> cognition, and vasculature. And we don't just do that once, but we did it over 19 time points because uh, not only does this slide allow me to talk really quickly at you, but it's uh, one of my favorite things is it's a real systems biology look at what happens in the body. So normally, I can even tell you in my own laboratory, generally we spent a lot of time down here and a little bit of time up here, but never until this study have we had a really true multi-omic molecular portrait of an entire body, and certainly not over, over time. So this is a really exciting study to kind of force all of us to become interdisciplinary. So what, we, what have we seen? So it's all, you're probably here wondering, what have we seen? So I'm going to walk you through what, we, what we've seen uh, through the context uh, of the central dog one. There's some, you can read about here, the stress of space travel that we found. So we'll start out here with the central dog one. So DNA, RNA, protein, most in the audience probably have seen this before. We'll start with DNA first. So at the genetic level, what changed? Now you think of your DNA, it should be the same over time because your DNA is pretty stable, but I, I did tell you that you will lose chromosomes, you will accumulate mutations. And generally, your telomeres should shrink over time. But one of the most surprising things we saw, as you can see here, this is astronaut control, sorry, regular controls, Mark Kelly, and then Scott Kelly. You can see here, 
in space, his telomeres got longer, a completely unexpected finding from the study that showed that he was actually elongating, almost as if he was getting younger in space. Then we looked and said, well, is, could this be real? So we looked at actually 11 other astronauts, and since the first studies have been released, we've now validated this in 11 other astronauts. So it's not just Scott. It actually seemed to be some really peculiar aspect of spaceflight where you get a little bit genetically you know, younger. And, and again, the controls don't go up as much. You can see astronauts go up. And so, uh, you know, this is kind of a surprising finding, and has, of course, led to some interesting headlines in the media where they said, you know, you can go to space and get taller and younger because <laughs> there was less compression on his spinal cord, so he actually gained a couple inches, and he also lost about 7% of his body weight. So one reporter had said, well, Dr. Mason, I can get taller, younger, and lose weight. You know, I'm going to space tomorrow. And I said, well, yeah, but how, how much did you really gain or lose? So is it like Matthew McConaughey in Interstellar? Did he lose te decades of his life? You know, so I did the calculation once on the way to Houston. How much, he was traveling closer to the speed of light and his telomeres got longer, so how much time did he gain? If you look at the time dilation equation, assume an orbital velocity of 400 kilometers, it's actually only about 0.1 seconds difference that he gained time relative to all of us and his brother. So that's not the biggest fa factor, but he did, he is technically younger chronologically, and he is also uh, a little bit telomeres, uh, telomere length no longer, but it went away as soon as he got back to Earth. And within about 48 hours, it was gone, as you can see here on this plot. So you can see it went away. So it doesn't stick with you, it goes away, gravity sucks is really the only thing I can tell you. Um, but the other thing is, is he did get a little bit uh, younger, but he also had other damages. You can see here in blue are, are these uh, inversions, essentially when chromosomes are broken and then reconnected uh, in a way that you would not want, in the not, way they're not supposed to, compared to his brother and compared to other controls. Over time, it has slowly increased, and so he's actually accumulated these low-level genetic variations. Uh, this is at a gross chromosomal level, and we're also validating some right now in lab to look at very specific uh, small mutations as well. But you can see, so this, you know, maybe you get a little bit younger, but you're mutated, so maybe it's not as good as you might think. This is one thing we observed. The other thing we saw at the genetic level is actually in all of your bodies right now, in your bloodstream, there's fragments of DNA floating around, called cell-free DNA, cell-free nucleic acids. And we looked to see how many of them would show up in the bloodstream and looked at Mark versus Scott and looked across all human chromosomes. And you can see it's fairly flat, but there's one outlier, and this is actually the mitochondrial uh, chromosome. That's actually mitochondrial DNA that spiked particularly in the early mission and again at the, at the end. And what this represents are these powerhouses of your cells, essentially which gives you a lot of your energy and ATP in your cells are being ejected and fragmented and thrown into the bloodstream at a rate we've not seen. It's the highest we've seen from any control. Uh, in any astronaut, and is really also a very novel finding. So why, why would this occur? Some evidence from the literature is that this is uh, the body's response to what are called, oh, let's go here, to uh, if it's having, if it's in its sepsis or it's doing an immune challenge, it will eject mitochondria into the bloodstream as a way to counteract uh, sort of this infection. So is it like space invaders? No, I'm not saying it's space invaders, but just it is the body's immunological response to what it perceives as a crisis. And so again, something we did, couldn't have expected to see until we actually just grabbed the astronaut and sequenced him. You know, more gently than that, but we sequenced him. Uh, the other thing this represents is, is why is it you know, viewing zero gravity as an immune response? Some of it might also be just physiological. So in particular, when you go up into space, you gain about three liters of, of fluid goes to your upper body, which you know, since we've evolved on Earth, we're used to gravity. Our bodies are constantly trying to essentially push fluids back up when they go down, but suddenly you don't have to. So you'll gain about one to two inches, and you essentially have a lot of pressure in your upper body. And so some of this we think is just the sheer stress of the body dealing with suddenly uh, the fluids in the body being pushed around. So this is something else we've seen. So that's at the genetic level. And then we want to look also at the epigenome. So in particular, uh, this is the regulatory layer behind DNA. So how is DNA packaged and regulated and turned on? And you know, most of you know the genetic code is ACGT, but this is really just the beginning. If you look here in black is the genetic code, in red is the epigenetic code, how you can tweak with small chemical changes how genes get turned on and turned off and get regulated. You can see here many varieties of epigenetic changes. And it's very important on day one, in particular, this methyl cytosine, this small molecule here. What happens is uh, when you're an embryo, actually the day one when you're, this is a sperm and egg as they've come together. This is a mouse embryo, but you can imagine your own embryogenesis. When you, when you came together as an egg and sperm, you might remember this. There was uh, wine and soft music. There was uh, <laughs> candles. It was very, that's how I remember my embryogenesis. I don't know. That's what I imagined. I don't know if it was there. It was too small, but it was definitely romantic, I think. So, uh, but when egg and sperm come together, this is actually an antibody for methylcytosine. And you can see the father's genome gets epigenetically reprogrammed first. You can see, if, so if you've lost that green, you're stripping away those epigenetic marks and resetting them all to go back down to near zero, except for a few genes. And so this is one cell, you become two cells, you become four cells, eventually all of you become trillions of cells. 
but you have to reset the epigenetic mark so you can become from one cell all the cell types in your body. And so one of the questions we had in the study was, you know, this is normal biology, this is what we expected to see. But there was a paper in 2013 that said that maybe DNA methylation can predict how old you are. So all of you in this room, you're going to leave you know, some DNA behind on the chairs. And if you don't want to tell me how old you are, it doesn't matter. You don't have to. I can wait till you leave the room and I can sequence your DNA and use this algorithm to predict how old you are uh, just based on the DNA that you've left behind because of the, the epigenetic state of your cells. And so you could imagine in the future, what if you could have sequencers that were even very smaller, like could even be attached to your phone, as with your about the minion, which I'll tell you about later in, the, in, the, in this talk. Uh, and so this could also change cultural things. If you remember when you were a kid or when I was a kid, to get a fake ID was really hard. I had, to, I had an older brother, uh, you had an old cousin, but now you can go online and go to yoids.com. You can get a, a fake ID from any state in the union if you want to and go to any bar that you want to. And then yes, you can pay by Bitcoin if you're wondering. Uh, so this could potentially change, you know, think epigenetics, but what if you're trying to get into the bar and what if someone says you're not allowed to get into this bar because I've checked your epigenetic age right here and you're too young so you're not going to get in. You know, could this happen? I don't know. That's the end of my social bar commentary for the evening. Uh, but it's, a, it's a seed of thought of, of what can happen uh, when, you, when you can detect epigenetics that well. But there's other reasons why epigenetics can change though. We've published work showing that in cancer, not surprisingly, it changes as well. So this is one reason. You can have leukemia and that can change. But we just wanted to see, well, what about in the astronauts? If we measure the epigenetic age, did they get younger there as well? So uh, what you can see here for Scott in blue and Mark in green, it was pretty variable. He was started low and went up a little bit epigenetically older during flight and then came back down after he returned to Earth. But this is his chronological age here in red. So he's still about, you know, essentially 50 years old, uh, uh, but had higher variants, but de definitely didn't seem as if he got dramatically epigenetically younger, ex except in, in the mission. It looks like, if anything, he got a little bit epigenetically older but generally pretty close to 50. So we think the telomeres was a very unique feature and epigenetically he got almost a little bit older, but it came back down when he got back to Earth. So this is something that uh, it wasn't quite as dramatic, but we can tell you that he's still approximately 50 years old epigenetically. So that's at the epigenetic level. Then there is RNA. We want to see what genes change in space. So in particular, this is the RNA level of gene regulation when genes go up and go down. So what changed at the RNA level? So in particular, one thing we notice is that this is a, a really complex picture that shows all the changes from all the genes. And in particular, we want to look here. We see large bursts of purple when he was uh, in flight. And that's, that went away when he came back to Earth and that weren't there before. So purple being essentially, you can see you're down and orange being up, like large bursts of genes. Thousands of genes going up and some going down that then return back to normal upon, upon uh, come, returning to Earth. And so we thought that most genes actually did return to normal, but some did not. So about 7% of genes actually still were perturbed six months after being back on Earth. So we thought, well, you know, what are those genes? It's interesting, let's take a look at them. But before, while we were in the middle of this analysis, uh, we, uh, this, we presented at one of the NASA meetings and said, well, 7% of genes had kind of changed. Maybe these like space genes. Uh, and then the Daily Mail put out a post that said, his, Scott Kelly has different DNA than his identical twin, and he no longer has a twin, which we never said. But this got picked up, and it said, then Time picked it up and said he's no longer an exact genetic match with his identical twin brother. These are space genes. So it was kind of bubbling up in the press, and we're like, oh, these guys got it all wrong. But what didn't help uh, is actually Scott then tweeted and said, well, my DNA changed by 7%. Who knew? I just learned about this. It's good news. I no longer have to call him my identical twin brother anymore because he's so mutated, he's not like me anymore. And then I was like, well, thank, thanks, Scott. But then Mark retweeted and said, well, I used to have an identical brother, and then this happened. So then uh, that got picked up. Then it exploded, basically. This happened back in March. Then Fox News picked it up and said they no longer has ident identical DNA. It got picked up in the Telegraph, and they're no longer genetically identical. And you can see then Spiegel got into the mix. There was a French newspaper, uh, Daily Show picked up space genes. It got out of control. And then finally, we worked with NASA to put out a press release to say, well, his genes changed expression, but his DNA was still mostly the same. But there's a difference between genes being active and just DNA itself. So we had to put out a press release. Uh, and then, you know, the wire came back uh, and helped us here. And then the New York Times said, don't worry what you've read. They're still <laughs> twins. Uh, the best is Life Science had a huge headline that, uh, one day that said, like, there's, space is destroying twins. And then the next day they said, we were totally wrong about that, Scott <laughs> Kelly, space gene story. So it was a great back and forth and a teachable moment for genetics, epigenetics, and gene expression that I spent a whole day talking to reporters about. So, um, so what did change was gene expression. So not just the genes being lost. And as I said at one point, if he lost 7% of his DNA, he'd no longer be human. He'd be even different than a chimp. So... Uh, but what did change, some of these genes that I talked about earlier, were hypercapnia, immune system genes, DNA repair, and even bone formation genes were all upregulated or downregulated and changed during flight. 
And when, the one that was really surprising was hypercapnia, or high carbon dioxide. We thought, well, that's interesting. You think like the, the carbon dioxide levels would be re really well regulated on the space station. But Scott complained about it even in his book. And then when we, we called NASA and said, can we get the flight logs and look at the CO2 levels? And it turns out there were some times that it was actually uh, di di dipping up, uh, you know, and this is more nominal levels, but getting up in general through most of the mission was pretty high and would spike up in some points uh, to higher levels of carbon dioxide. So this was part of the, the stress. We could actually see it physiologically uh, in his genes changing expression. And then also we observed the same thing in flight from mitochondrial RNA as well as DNA. We saw this also observed during flight. So we can see these genes all, uh, indicating stress during space flight. Again, that, that measure of mitochondrial stress. Okay, so that's at the genetic and epigenetic and transcriptional level in human cells, which are great. You all have human cells. You all have wonderful human cells. Some of you more than others, but you all look great. Uh, but you also have about uh, probably two times, maybe five times as many microbial cells on and in your body. And so we also looked at the microbiome as well, what changed in the gut essentially, and also sequenced the DNA in his mouth. So here you can see there's a lot of lines to show different species that change. There's still a lot of species. It's not like you suddenly lose all your microbial diversity in space. You can see there's a lot of colors here. But what did change in flight is the firmicutes to bacteriotes ratios, which are these two different genera of bacteria that are generally linked to poor gut health if you have this spike in this ratio. So it looked as if there was some gut stress during flight, uh, which we um, you know, saw for the first time here in these astronauts. And so we're looking now in other astronauts to see if this replicates. But we can see here there is some evidence of um, you know, what happened as gut not being happy. We did ask Scott if he would eat all the same food as Mark uh, during the entire mission, to which he said, hell no, basically. He said um, <laughs> you know, he wanted to have margaritas and nachos and just have his normal terrestrial life. So that did not happen. So yes, they were eating different foods, so that's not totally surprising. They would have a slightly different micro microbial gut microbiome signature. The one thing is we did is we also sequenced part of his saliva and buccal samples from his mouth and fecal. And you can see here, this is a good moment in, in, in biology when the samples by, from your mouth and from your butt don't cluster together. They're different. <laughs> it's bad when they come together. You don't, know, you don't know why that happens. You don't want that to happen. Uh, but this is, you know, we also examined what happened in their mouth. And what was really interesting is you can see we also matched to fruits and vegetables and any of their animal DNA. And these are all, you can see there's a very different plot. It's because this is all the DNA that was in his mouth. So we actually validated what was in his diet by sequencing the DNA in his mouth. And you can see here, the only thing that makes it out the other end is mostly plant material. So if you've ever wondered, this plot is for you. Um, and so we can, uh, there's, you know, uh, monitor what they're eating and doing uh, with a shotgun sequencing method. So, so that's a quick level highlights uh, of what we've seen. So I want to take the last sort of uh, seven, eight minutes of the talk to think about well, what's next. Now, clearly, this is one of the least powered studies in human history. We have only two people. There's been one study that had one person that was published in Cell, but this is the second place. But there's only 561 people that have ever left Earth that have gone to space. So that's really the maximum we could study, and some of them are dead as well. So uh, this is the maximum we could get. Uh, but NASA has already announced plans for 30 more subjects to do longer missions. We've begun working with them on this plan. We've also begun uh, to actually recreate this study with uh, climbers that go up into Everest, because one of the questions has been, well, is this, is this like scuba diving? Is it like climbing a mountain? And there, we had no real data. So we've begun to collect uh, this data as well. And the other thing we've done is to say, well, wouldn't it be great if we could do this faster, right? So you can see here, we launched a mission to say, well, couldn't we just sequence DNA in space? We have to get the samples back down. It's a real pain. What if we could just sequence much faster? So what we wanted to do was use a nanopore sequencer, uh, which is a very small device about this big, uh, that actually uh, works by as DNA transits through a pore, you can read the electrical current of DNA and actually just do sequencing with a small device just this big. And so at, at $10,000 per kilogram, this is what you want to put up in a space. So we proposed this mission with Aaron Burton and others at NASA, and they said, okay, well, it sounds like a cool mission. The first thing you're going to need is a patch. So we said, okay, great. We should get a patch. Uh, we've got a patch. All right, good. We've got a little nanopore sequencer going up into space. We're all set. So we started planning the mission. And uh, on one of the you know, calls, we were starting to send up more supplies for the, you know, getting ready for the twin study. And the CRX-7 blew up on the way to the space station. I was like, oh, this is really bad. How are we going to start doing, you know, essentially planning for this other mission, the sequencing mission? But I actually had this really touching moment from NASA. They sent me a letter that said, you know, we're sorry, Dr. Mason, that we blew up your supplies. But space is hard, as Scott Kelly tweeted. And we're going to urge you to continue your inquiry, and we're going to send up more supplies. So hang in there. It's a very touching moment to get a letter from NASA. Like, if the NIH cuts your grant, you don't get a letter. You don't really get an email. They're like, we just cut your budget in half and like, deal with it. You know, so it was very NASA kind of touching that way. So. We started talking on one of the calls and said, okay, we've got to send up more supplies. This is getting problematic. But they said, uh, Andy Feinberg is one of the investigators. He said, hey, I'm going up in the parabolic flight simulator or the vomit comet. Does anyone have any ideas for experiments? I said, well, yeah, we're going to send up this nanopore sequencer. Let's see if it even works at all in zero gravity. 
So we said, okay, we'll send it up to me. I'm gonna try these new pipettes. I'm gonna go back here and uh, I'm gonna see if I can get this to work. And you can see here, this is a, you know, if, if any of you have pipetted before, normally you want your tips to stay in place. Uh, but you can see here, they did not integrate. So you can see why we didn't use tip boxes for this eventual experiment. But he's you know, trying to keep his lunch down. Behind Andy right now, there's actually people puking behind him right now. Things are floating around, and eventually things just, uh, you know, when you get to the end of the parabola, uh, then eventually they'll come back down. So he's a really good sport about it. Kept it going. If he did manage to actually load the flow cell, got it in there, we showed that you could, you know, sequence in zero gravity. It was possible. And then published this in, in uh, 2015 or 16 and said, okay, it's, it's working. And then the next astronaut going up happened to be Kate Rubin, who's a trained virologist. This is her loading a flow cell for the first time. And then she made her way up to the space station. We sent a resupply rocket back up that made it up there almost exactly two years ago, just over two years ago. And this is the first time she was trying to do sequencing in space on the nanopore sequencer. The NASA added that music. That was not me. It's dramatic. That was not my editing job. But you can see here the first time it happened. So uh, we got some reads coming. I was actually on vacation. I was supposed to be on vacation. I'm like, wait, I've got data coming from space. I'm staying, I'll be in the pool in a second. And I was there. Uh, I'll do, so it came down. We showed that, you know, uh, it actually worked in space. It was a, a game changer, according to NASA. Uh, they, it was called by some the dawn of genomics in space. This was huge on Twitter. Four re retweets right there. You see that? <laughs> Giants. Huge deal. Uh, that was pretty exciting. Uh, and then, um, but it did get more tweets when NASA says something. So we did sequence a billion bases in space and showed that you could actually uh, sequence in zero gravity and then assemble the genome in space. So what's really exciting now is because of two of the other uh, grants that just got approved is actually we'll be doing real-time sequencing on the space station for any infection and also for general surveillance. And so this has become a standard protocol, which you can see here some of the, the gear that we use on the space station. And so um, in principle, if you do get out to Mars and you make it where this is NASA's poster for precision medicine, uh, you would be able to sequence there based on some of these protocols. So I'm gonna close in the last few minutes, or in the last two sections, to think about uh, engineering questions. And in, in, the, in the promissory notice that I would talk about a 500-year plan uh, this evening, so I'll take you there now. Um, I think actually how well we understand anything in biology is really a, a simple question of can you change something or engineer it and then predict what happens next. So in medicine, we often think about precision medicine, but I think the next step is can you be more predictive about what will change when you add a drug, when you change a nucleotide, when you modify something. And this will help us for understanding health and disease. And there's a question of, you know, I, what my hypothesis is that I think we can genetically protect astronauts, not just protect them physiologically or pharmacologically, but maybe genetically. This is an idea here. But then the question really becomes, well, should we do such a thing? Should we be engineering people to have them be able to survive in other planets? How would you do such a thing? So I'll close with a more philosophical notes on ways you could think about doing that. Now, it's, uh, you might think at first, well, Chris, you're kind of crazy because you can't just engineer people. There's some big questions there about how you should do that, well, why you would do that, uh, and should we do it at all? But these ideas, which used to be science fiction, have now been uh, coalesced into something called the Genome Project, right? Which is a consortium of which I'm a member here. You can see the whole consortium. People think about engineering biology from scratch uh, and thinking about the ways to do it ethically and responsibly and carefully. Uh, and again, it seems far-fetched that well, engineering biology, but it's already happening. So just last fall, uh, there was a repair of a gene that causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a heart disease, uh, in embryos, human embryos, before they could be implanted. So you can already take an embryo if you see something wrong, repair it, and then potentially implant it. But this guy making kind of a smug looking face right here, I think he's very <laughs> excited about what he did there, but he's not showing his excitement, but he's definitely he's, he's accomplished. Um, and the other idea is actually, well, what if you go blind, for example? You have 200 million rod neurons, but you have 5 million cones, which help you with color and patterns. What if you could genetically reprogram some of your rod neurons to become cones and, and become, go from being blind to being able to see again? Well, that's already happened, actually. So you can actually take the cells, reprogram them, re-engineer them, and then essentially cure blindness. Or what if you don't think about the epigenome? What if you want your epigenetic age to be lower? Can you actually epigenetically reprogram? And this also has already happened as of earlier this spring. You can actually um, repair fragile X syndrome and repair epigenetically changed genes, at least in mice and probably eventually in humans. And so these ideas, again, which were very much science fiction only two years ago, are now already appearing in major journals, already appearing in the press, and also launching clinical trials around the world for engineering T cells, what's called immunotherapy. So this is a backdrop. I'm going to give you a, a quick view of what could happen in the next 500 years. So I penned this in 2011 as a series of ideas for a genetically engineered machine competition and said, okay, well, 500 years, why 500 years? Well, 50 is kind of within our lifetime. You can see that. 5,000 is pretty far away. It's hard to imagine. But 500, you can actually, I think, conceptualize and think about it. I think actually 
every human being, that one of the most defining features of humans is the ability to think far in the future. And it's actually arguably one of the most defining human traits. And so everyone here could have a 500 plan. You should have a 500 plan. So uh, I think it's, it's, your, it's your right and duty as a human being with cognitive abilities. So I'll just show you mine and you can, have, you can tell me yours with cocktails. It's always better to do 500 plans with cocktails, I've found. But here's what I think. So what's exciting is I wrote this about nine years ago, and we're coming to the end of phase one, where I thought that we would complete the functional annotation of the human genome, understand which areas cannot be changed, and those which maybe could be tolerable to mutations or change. We're actually getting pretty close to this, this state of understanding the human genome that well, and we'd start to have synthetic and systems biology. And so I wrote this nine years ago, it's actually coming true. Part of it is because the cost to sequence DNA has come down so fast. It used to be, it, for a little while, every five months, the cost to do any genetics experiment got cut in half. And so it was a great time to plan experiments, because if you just waited long enough, you could do four, eight, 16 times the number of samples, or, or divide that into the cost. And so this is the sequencing aspect. But then also, what started back in 2009 until today is the discovery of new genes. Like, so how many human genes are there? This is in blue. We're still finding fundamental elements of the human genome. The human gene discovery is still ongoing, you can see here in blue. And there's a lot of other genes there, uh, types of genes. So this is, I think this phase of discovery is nearing completion, but it's still ongoing. But once we get to phase two, we'll assume that genome sequencing is, is common, cheap, and accurate. And we'll start to think about new ways to integrate elements into mammalian genomes and, and study astronauts over a longer term. This too has already been announced. So there'll be 30 more astronauts here planned for long duration missions. There's also a plan to begin doing exploration in planets nearby. So in particular, the Mars 2020 rover is going out to collect samples of rocks. And about the year 2025, it's going to bring these rocks back so we can actually analyze them and potentially sequence them. To, so one of these things we're doing is sequencing the clean room where they build all the robots. So when we bring something back, we can make sure we didn't just resequence something that we sent to Mars and then brought back again. Uh, this is going to be the beginning of phase two, is start to do this exploration to understand, uh, you know, is there our inner planets better? And I think in phase three, uh, this is actually the first time I've presented this publicly, so I'm curious for uh, uh, thoughts or critiques at the end. But uh, we begin the long-term trial on the human genome engineering. To actually, we have to look for off-target effects. Like, what would we engineer? What genes would you add to a human genome, take away or modify? Again, it's already happening in clinical trials, but could you do it to help astronauts? And so which genes would you modify? I think any of the space genes would be fair game. One of the most notable ones that's come up in the literature is, what about P53? It's sort of the guardian of the genome. It controls DNA repair. What if you add extra copies of P53? You can see this is what elephants do. This is the number of copies they have in their genome. Could we do the same thing and add extra copies? Well, potentially we could. You could CRISPR them in. But one interesting thing that's just been published a month ago is if you start to engineer cells with CRISPR, you might end up actually enriching for those cells that are mutated for P53. Because if you break a bunch of DNA, which are the cells that are actually you know, going to come and, and, and populate your body? It's going to be those that are defective in P53 because they can't repair things fast enough. And actually, they might take over um, different parts of your body. So there will be some potential downsides of breaking lots of DNA and adding P53. But it's possible. I think phase four gets further. As you can see, it gets more vague as we'll go farther out. But what if we could test protected human genomes in space environments, like the tardigrade? You might have heard this, the, the water bug, the, the space, space bear. It can survive in the vacuum of space. Uh, and actually, it's kind of, some people think it's cute. Some people think it's awfully terrifying. <laughs> I'm kind of in the, I uh, just hope I don't find you in my shower kind of uh, feel. But it's a, it's a tardigrade. And actually, it literally can survive in space. And so there's been a great paper uh, a year and a half ago that it's extremely, it's extremely tolerant. And actually, it has these genes like DSUP. And so we've been adding DSUP genes to hex cells, human cells, in the lab and irradiating them. And we've already seen that they can actually survive radiation more by adding them to human cells. So it's just human cells, not like doing it in people, uh, but it is definitely a possibility. So in phase five, you, this gets farther out there. You begin going out to other planets, maybe synthetic, complete synthetic genomes. This might seem crazy, but this is from some of having exploring alien oceans, but it's already on NASA's website. There's a, a Europa is a, a moon of, of, of Jupiter that actually shoots out water out into the space, and there's going to be uh, the, the Europa Clipper is going to go through and capture some of that water and also bring it back to Earth late in the, in the mid 2030s. And so this is just something we'll see what explore what's out there, start to go to these worlds. And if, when you go to these worlds, you're going to start to think about you're going to need to have energy, right? So, like, if you think on Earth, if you're like, what if I just didn't have to eat anymore? Could I just not eat? Like, think about plants. They just have chlorophyll. They just lay out in the sun and they get all their energy. Couldn't I do that? Couldn't I just lay by the pool? Or if I'm on Europa, the pools of Europa, I don't have, you know, I just want to lay out in the sun. There's not a lot of food on Europa, on the, on the moon. So could you do this? And if you did this, how much, how much skin would you need with, with chlorophyll? Could you even do such a thing? So um, I was interviewed once about this, and uh, <laughs> someone called me and said, could you? I said, well, let me do the math on this, and let me just think. So I emailed everyone in the lab and said, well, Here's my numbers. What does everyone think about sort of the, how much skin you'd need, how much it's exposed? You know, 0.5, because only half your skin's exposed at a time because you wouldn't be like this. So uh, what's, the, what's the photon capture? Well, how much do you have for photon loss? 
How much skin would you need? You need actually about two tennis courts worth of skin uh, for one hour, and you could get all the energy you need, you know, assuming a few hundred kilojoules of energy spent that per day. So that's not that bad. And on Europa, you might just need maybe five or ten tennis courts of skin. It would look really weird and creepy, but it would just mean technically, biologically, it's possible. So the last phase is to think about where else can we learn from extremophiles? So you'd have to think about, and Europa is very cold. Anything else we'd go beyond uh, sort of the, the Goldilocks zone would be very hard to survive in. But there are many organisms that do, can and do survive in extreme environments. So we have one project called the Extreme Microbiome Project, where we study organisms that uh, survive in high salinity, temperature, toxicity, or pressure, and we can take lessons from them and potentially apply it uh, to ourselves in the future. So looking farther ahead, this gets, this gets pretty far out. So you need to have to send people out you know, to far out to look for Earth-like planets, some of them maybe modified, plant, modified humans for other planets, and synthesize large uh, new sets of genes to get them there. And, and sequencing, uh, the sequencing cost has come down over the years, but the synthesis of DNA cost has gone down uh, not quite as fast, but it is coming down. So hopefully by the year you know, 2300, we could synthesize whole sets of genes and maybe genomes from scratch, potentially. Then farther out, maybe you start sending people out there to far other worlds. Actually, I was just chatting uh, you know, with my wife about, well, who would we send to live with us on other planets? We would probably want really intelligent organisms to come hang out with us and give them the greatest chance to evolve into other sentient creatures. So is it, you know, is it uh, primates, cetaceans, like dolphins? Is it probably octopuses and maybe cats and dogs? And do we have intelligent genes put into them? What if one of them overtakes us and they become smarter than us? Is it going to be like the planet of the octopuses uh, that they take over us? Maybe, but maybe we'd have to be okay with that as long as you know they um, distill whiskey or something. We might be okay with that. Uh, but you know, this is a, this is a, a bit farther. And then phase nine is we have to go to another solar system. But you can imagine this just begs the question: if you keep going solar system after solar system, you know, eventually the hardest question will be: well, what do we do at the end if there's a, a heat death of the entire universe or it implodes back in on itself? Should we re-engineer the entire structure of the universe to prevent that from happening? Uh, or do we just let it happen with the hope that life would arise again? And I think what we do, what we've always done as a species, is to protect ourselves and survive. And we probably would literally engineer the structure of the universe to survive. And so this is obviously farther out in the 10-phase uh, plan. I will, uh, I will, of course, be dead, long dead for this. But I think it's something, again, that it's a, it's a birthright of every human to think that far in advance. And in closing, you might think, again, to go back to the first slide, well, how do we have the hubris and, and sort of the, you know, the sort of... Um, really just the, the sort of selfish pride to say, we're going to go to another planet, monitor it, engineer it, tweak it, and then tweak other planets. How can you imagine such a thing? And I'll say, uh, for two things, two reasons why it's actually not that crazy an idea. It's actually not the first time we've done this. We already monitor and tweak and disrupt even the entire Earth ecosystem, and now we're trying to mitigate that and prevent that from happening to be too bad. But this would just be the second time we've done it. And the second thing is, okay, well, what if we contaminate Mars and disrupt the native ecosystem there, well, eventually the sun will engulf all the inner planets and it's all going to go anyway. So we have to go to Mars on the way out of the solar system anyway. The contamination is actually inevitable. Um, and so I think uh, we've begun that first step in heading that direction. So in closing, I want to thank everyone in lab uh, and who makes this possible, really inspiring and awesome people. Thanks to collaborators from uh, UCSF and also from JPL who helped us possible, also make this work possible. Thanks to Mark and Scott Kelly, who gave literally blood, sweat, and tears to the study. This is their official NASA poster. They get to pick what they look like in their poster. You can see they went for the Star Wars theme. There's the Death Star, just chilling in the background right there. And uh, thanks, uh, obviously, funding from NASA, but also World Quant Gates Foundation, NCI, and NIH. And again, thanks to many collaborators. Uh, and I'm happy to we'll start with some questions. And thank you very much for your time. Great. Good. All right. I think we can all agree, first of all, that you need to try the decaf. <laughs> um, Let's, let, let's start out. So what's the biggest concern here? We talked about radiation, microgravity, uh, fluid compartments moving around different things. And, and I guess they all have different effects or different stressors yeah, yeah. Uh, on the body. A long mission, like a mission to Mars, what do we worry about most? Or do we have to worry about all of them? Yeah, I, I mean, what I presented is a look at everything that could go wrong. But the biggest worries, I think, are radiation damage, which we can already see impacting Scott and other astronauts. And, and really, uh, you know, there's, there's a psychological aspect as well, being alone for that long in a mm -hmm. spacecraft. Uh, the, the radiation and the zero gravity, the loneliness. But I think if you had all of Netflix with you, it might be OK uh, for that. For the, yeah. the, but it seems like you could protect yourself from the radiation effects, no? Yeah, uh, to some degree, you know, the shielding could be thicker. And genetically, I mean, these are very much ideas right now and, and hypotheses. We, you know, we, we'd have to be really careful about doing any kind of genetic protection. But uh, the ideas and the feasibility studies have already started. But I think 
Uh, there's also work to try and make electromagnetic shielding. So if, if you can't make it thicker because it's too heavy, mm -hmm. you can uh, use electromagnetic defenses. There's also being uh, work done at NASA to try that. Who's got the microphone? So we'll, we'll walk around. If you've got a question, uh, raise, raise your hand. So now with these other uh, missions that, that NASA is, is proposing for longer, uh, longer, having more than a nano two, uh, and some of these longer missions, what other experiments or what other things do you want to look into that, that you didn't get a chance to with, with Mark and Scott? Yeah, the big question is just time. We know, we know that things change in the body, especially after space flight, but how long do they last? We only had the funding in the mission that went till, till six months after he came back. So we really want to see, does it go away after one year, two year? Are some of them really permanent? Like after five or 10 years, it hasn't changed. Uh, and to do that, we'll need more of uh, those studies and then also just more normal, healthy people who are studied longitudinally. You know, most most um, longitudinal genetic studies are just for people that have cancer or are already sick, but knowing what normal just drift over time looks like of aging would be helpful for these studies. Because it looked like a lot of those effects came back to baseline. Yep. Yeah, something like with, especially with the epigenetics, uh, yeah, and Which even the telomeres, and even the microbiome. So we, uh, in the paper that's in review now, we have a whole section that just says, here's what's plastic. Here are things that change a lot in space, but come back to normal, and those we're not as worried about. But the the low-level mutations and inversions that look like they just got worse over time and didn't go back to normal, those are the things we worry about, the radiation. So I think, uh, so there's a bit of good news and bad news. The good news is most things in general uh, can respond, can come back, they're plastic, mm -hmm. uh, but there are some things that, that don't seem to go back. Of course, if they don't, they, they come back once you come back here, but yeah, if, they're, right. if they have detrimental effects in, in a 500 day or, yep, yeah. you know, uh, mission, then that's an issue, right? Yes, or even gravity would be lower, of course, on Mars, and so uh, mm -hmm. you can get there, sure. maybe it wouldn't be as bad as mm -hmm. something we think. Okay, hopefully. We have a question there? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So the question is similar to what you guys just talked about is, uh, it seems that the measure and the differences that we measured in uh, genomics and in his physio physiological conditions when he came back were compared to when he comes back to Earth. But if we're mm -hmm. kind of intending for long-term space travel, yep. maybe the, the measure is not quite as relevant if, uh, you know, with coming back to Earth. And so uh, it'd be another, it's a great question. Could we, we can and we should study uh, longer duration missions and, uh, you know, obviously just what happens when you go out. I mean, he's still actually near a low Earth orbit, so really the space station is still relatively protected. So mm -hmm. what happens when you get beyond the magnetosphere of the planet and it's much more uh, exposed to galactic cosmic rays and uh, just radiation? So there's a mission going out uh, for the first launch of the, of the space launch system, the SLS. It will go around the moon first and come back, and we're putting in uh, human and bacterial cells there to see what happens to them. Uh, not a person, uh, but we will. But we did that before with Apollo, and so I think um, some of the first missions will be to look at that question uh, of, of when they're in space and more measures during spaceflight. But uh, ideally, we'd, we'd measure people for two, three years in space. But um, that's next, hopefully. Hmm. Next question. Oh, yes. that was exactly going to. That was going to be my question about uh, you know comparing our measurements in low Earth orbit versus beyond that, and what. Pro problems might occur if we're, you know, trying to prepare astronauts based on data from low Earth, low Earth orbit yeah. studies. So, uh, and this is a, a ongoing debate at NASA, how, how, how much can we extrapolate from what we know? Mm. We know it's limited, we know it's not perfect, but um, it, it will definitely, you know, get worse just because the radiation's higher, uh, some about 10 times higher if you get out past the moon. The interesting thing is also a psychological thing is the astronauts all want to go back up. So often their decimeters, which tell you how much radiation they've absorbed, hmm. uh, they will hide them in different places of the space station to look like they've been irradiated less so they can go back up again. So there's, we'll have to make sure that they keep it in the same spot. Because, yeah. I mean, ultimately, there's only so much we can really extrapolate yep. from the data we'll be able to gather, and ultimately it's going to be like getting married, a leap of faith to yeah. go to Mars, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and it's a good that, that, yeah. that works or doesn't, doesn't work. Next question over change. here. Yes. Uh, in line with the previous uh, question, an ongoing uh, argument in the space community is whether to go uh, straight to Mars or to go to the moon first, and I was wondering if you had an opinion on that, um, whether we could, if we go to the moon first, whether uh, that gives us better uh, odds at extrapolating what's, what's going to happen on Mars. Great question. So at NASA, at least from my experience, it's like really 50-50. Some people, like when I first got to the first mission briefing for the whole study, we got there and the Wi-Fi password was Mars or bust. And I was like, yes, this is great. But then later the next year, someone changed it to moon base. And so they're really, if people, it, even within NASA, there's a lot of disagreement because one is obviously much closer and tractable. Mars is much farther. And if something goes wrong, there's really not much you can do. So 
you know, I think in a perfect world, my answer would be both, that we would de deploy to both, but it's really resource limited. At, at one point, NASA's budget was 4% of the GDP of our country, and now it's about 0.1%. So there, there's not that much money for both. And I, I think um, the answer is going to be a lot of commercial space flight as well. Like, so Elon Musk is a crazy guy in a lot of ways, but he's helping to push the ideas to, mm -hmm. to go that direction. NASA feels like they have to hurry up in a sense. So it's a little bit of a space race again, but with commercial versus government instead of uh, Soviet and U.S. And yeah, how do uh, microbes do when you look at, at their uh, genomics and epigenomics? Uh, they, they get mutated as well, uh, but we've looked at some of the epigenetics. They, they don't change much at all, it turns out, epigenetically. So we uh, have a sort of a negative result there. They didn't seem to change, but they, but they do. The species themselves uh, change, and also they, one is they do become slightly more resistant to antibiotics uh, in zero gravity uh, for reasons that aren't clear. But there's been two studies that have shown that, so that's not good news for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Someone else over there? Oh. Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, I think you might have hinted at the answer to this question when you were talking about radiation, but I'm interested in the long-term follow-up of Scott. Uh, is this just in perpetuity? And the follow-up question is, are you going or would you go to Mars? Oh, great question. Um, so we will, Scott is technically retired, so he does it all out of the, to the goodness of his heart. Um, it's like if your employer asked you to come back in and draw blood, would you go? Maybe you'd go, maybe you wouldn't go. I'd be like, well, I'm in the Bahamas. I'm not coming in this month. So uh, he technically doesn't have to, but he has been coming back in for follow-up visits. And there's a longitudinal astronaut study, which all the astronauts are supposed to come in for annual checkups. Uh, and the answer is yes, in a heartbeat, I'd go, uh, even if it was a one-way trip. Uh, although I'd, I'd want my, I think our daughter to be older first, and then, then I'd go. And maybe she could come with, but um, it's really, it's, it's a personal choice. But how many people here in the room would go? Anybody? Would you go? Yeah. Interestingly, if you do an elementary school class, all the kids put their hand up. So <laughs> something happens between age eight and, uh, you know, we have too much to lose now. Yes, you had a question? Oh, yeah. So I was wondering, um, you mentioned about the uh, ratio between the Bacteroides and the Firmicutes. Um, and you also mentioned how the uh, there's an increase in the hypercapnia genes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, if all if both of those things are related to the high amount of mitochondria that we're getting shucked out into the bloodstream. Uh, so I don't know if it's related to the mitochondria. It's a good hypothesis. We uh, we think so, but we don't know. It's just um, we see the correlation right now, but we don't know the causation. But we did see um, some of the uh, changes in species that respond to higher carbon dioxide levels that did change in the gut microbiome. So I didn't talk about it, but we did see a connection there. So, so do you think the change in ratio is due to the stress on the body then? Or? Generally, the stress on the body as well as the, potentially the radiation, but I think more just the stress on the body. And, and the food is still human food. You can see they still had a microbiome. It was fairly diverse. Mm -hmm. It lost you know, some ratios between uh, genera changed, but they still had microbes in them and were relatively healthy. But there's other factors too. They don't like to eat in space or, or drink that much water because using the toilet is a real pain. It, it basically, you have to mm. turn it on, set up the vacuum, get situated. It takes like 20 minutes to go to the bathroom. So as a consequence, they don't eat as much or drink as much water. So he lost 7% of his body weight. Mm. And some of that's just because it's, it's not pleasant just to move around or to go to the bathroom. So that's a factor as well. If someone on, uh, on a, a human on Earth ate the same diet, these freeze-dried foods and things that they eat in space, does their microbiome change as much? So there have been studies for mice have shown that it doesn't change that much. It's still relatively healthy food. Um, also, the flavor, if anyone ever goes to NASA, you can be a taste tester. You can they have these booths where they want to make sure the food doesn't taste awful um, in space. So you can try the space food before it goes up. And there, too, the, the flavors seem to be relatively mm -hmm. you know, comparable. And uh, in mouse studies, uh, it doesn't seem to, but we haven't done. This is one of the first human studies. Hmm. So that's where we see data. Someone else? Yes. Thank you for a fascinating, delightful presentation. You mentioned that we're still finding more of the human genome. Mm -hmm. Would you care to speculate as to whether that's because we just haven't found it all yet, or maybe humanity is evolving? Because we know from the fossil record that okay. Darwin was wrong about the rate at which evolution occurs. It doesn't occur randomly over millions. It occurs rapidly and fits and starts. So you think it's possible that some of that, to use a term I hate, junk DNA is maybe being coded into something new? Yeah, actually, Nico's Twitter handle is not so junk DNA. So this, <laughs> this is a, an ongoing debate in the genetics community is how much is uh, should we even use the word junk? What does it mean? Um, so I actually, in my PhD thesis, I put this quote in that says, uh, from Gregory Pesco, it says, calling something junk just because we don't understand what it does is strikes me as short-sighted. I prefer to think of our genome as funky rather than junky, <laughs> functionally unknown rather than junky. So I subscribe to that. I put it in my cover page of my thesis is that you know, we, 
we, we're still discovering them, but I think it's just because we haven't only been able to sequence genomes really until the last few years, even though the first genome was done in 2001 and really completed in 2003. Uh, for a little while, there were more people that had walked on the moon than had had their genome sequenced as late as 2007. Hmm. So uh, there's one person who called them uh, genome knots, like you're like an astronaut of genomes, a genome knot. That term didn't catch on by anybody, but it's, uh, <laughs> the idea is that it used to be really rare only as little as 10 years ago. And so now um, some of it's just, it's gotten cheap enough to start to really examine Every, actually, is also, uh, Dr. Ravina said, you know, every single cell type in the, in the body is still unknown as a large project to just figure out that question. It's like, well, how many kinds of cells are in the human body? We're still figuring that out. Or how many genes are there in the human genome? It's still going up. But I think it's not because of evolution, just, uh, just we haven't been able to see it until now. Hmm. So, which actually means, uh, you know, that we're discovering more things every day. There's more genetic data every day uh, than the day before. And so it actually means that every day, that you wake up as a geneticist is the best day to be a geneticist because there's never been more data than this day. So every single day you wake up is the best day possible to be a geneticist. So very cool. Anyone else? Empirically. So so first of all, I want to thank you for talking about Houston without saying that you have a problem. That's that's great. Um, so se second, you you spoke about uh, CRISPR or genetic engineering to uh, uh, cure some disease or to. Uh, do an interruption uh, intervention before the birth of the of the the babies, and it, it struck me as very different than the idea of uh, protecting the astronauts and and you know making some change or doing something before their birth and then having those baby and tell tell them well you're going to be an astronaut my son, mm -hmm. and they won't have that choice and I think that's where the ethical uh, choice has to be made that you know we, it is very and it's the same problem with very long-term uh, space flight where they start to say that they will send a first generation, they will have a second generation and a third generation in the space shuttle yeah. in, in order to arrive somewhere. And that means the first generation will have it, will be volunteers, yeah. but the second and third will not. That's and not and that <laughs> seems something I don't think anybody in modern society is ready to, to make. Yeah. And so uh, do you really think that will be possible, that someday we will do that? And I think that's really going to be the first time in history of humanity that we'll impose that to some unborn child? That's a great question. Uh, I kind of alluded to it saying, well, how do we have the hubris or what's the ethical questions? Mm -hmm. But that's the, the, the crux of, uh, you know, the, the evisceration of the liberty of the person that's born. Say, well, I've already been mandated to be this thing or to be, you know, sort of marooned on this spacecraft. And so, and so it'd be strange. Imagine you wake up and say, you're the third generation of approximately six that will just live and die on this spacecraft on your way towards, you know, could be you know, Alpha Centauri or somewhere else, um, which is terrifying. But I still think what's interesting is that, that that's not that different from what we have now. We're all going to be born and die on the same spacecraft called Earth, right? Mm -hmm. a, and it's not going anywhere. You can't, it, where it's down this point. There's a lot more things to do here. Uh, there's a lot more uh, volition, though, if you're born and you can do whatever you want. But, but fundamentally, the, 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 the sense of being stuck in one place where generations will be born and die and have nowhere else to go uh, is already here. It's just it's a bigger spacecraft. But 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 so so are you an optimist or a pessimist? Is is are you advocating for that because you think Earth is dead and will be you know unlivable in the future? In because at the moment, I mean, it's very clear to me that Earth is a better place to live than Mars yeah, or a space yes, shuttle. Yeah, right? uh, no, I'm very much an optimist. For now. I, for now. I, <laughs> for now, anyway. I think, right, right. Um, that's why I'm asking, you know, are you optimist or pessimist? I'm very much an optimist, and I don't want to leave Earth to go to Mars. You know, some people complain there's too much nitrogen here. There's you know, other problems with the planet. But it's our home, right? It's where everything has happened uh, that has ever occurred in humanity, it, you know. I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to leave here. I just want to have a backup plan for humanity. But currently, if anything happens to this planet, that's it. Everything that humans have ever done, accomplished, acquired, even if we have perfect peace, it's all gone with one bad asteroid. So it really, my anxiety is just that there, there is, um, there, everything could be lost at this point. And so if we're, at least we're on two planets, at least there's a little bit of a backup plan. Um, you know, that, that there is some ability to preserve everything that humans have done. So I think we're worth preserving as long as possible. So. <laughs> And, and I'd, eventually we would have to leave Earth, but it's like three billion years, so we've got some time, but, yeah. but it's not infinite. So let me take the uh, uh, moderator's prerogative, if you will, and kind of ask the last question, which was, you, you sort of got, got into it there. Many years ago, I, I, I interviewed Mike Collins and, and Buzz and, and, and Neil Armstrong, and, and I asked them that, that same question, mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. are we doing this? And they, their, their answer wasn't really about preserving mm. the species. It was, a, it was a little different. Mm. Do you think that there's something else that drives us to explore? Yeah, the, 
the native, I mean, as a, from the smallest cell of discovering entirely new genes that have never been seen before uh, to, you know, discovering new ecosystems, new planets. I think that might be more fundamental than, than the fear of losing everything. I think that might be more my particular uh, motivation is that I have this sense of deep tragedy of just imagining uh, that it would all be lost, that everything we've ever done accomplished, the literature, the music, the poetry, everything in humanity could someday just be gone. Uh, I find upsetting, right? but other people, I think, just the pure joy of discovery, which which happens in the lab every day, uh, well, not every day, most days, good days in the lab, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is 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 something that drives almost. Uh, I think that's also more human, maybe more so than than the fear of, of death. But they're no, pretty Columbus, close. Columbus, Magellan, yeah. all of them. I mean, they, you know, no, they weren't just they weren't worried about losing everything. Yeah, they, they really wanted things. just to find new things. So uh, it, may, it could be maybe uh, tightly intertwined motivators, one of hope and one of fear. I guess it's very Machiavellian. Like, how do you <laughs> how do you rule by love or fear? So maybe do both. I guess. Plenty of food for thought. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. It's fabulous. Really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.